Before we begin, I wanted to note that this interview was recorded in early May of 2020. Obviously, a lot has happened in the world between our conversation and this episode's August release, so please keep that context in mind as we discuss the novel's themes and how they reflect our current pandemic. Hey readers and writers, I'm Adrian Buskey, and you're listening to Fictitious, a podcast about the storytelling craft of science fiction and fantasy. My guest this episode is Pung Shepard, author of The Book of M. This debut speculative fiction novel examines a near-future world fallen to an epidemic called The Forgetting. Millions of people have lost their shadows, and soon after, their memories incurably erode as well. Society has collapsed as the shadowless spread, and their forgetting warps aspects of reality in alarming and unexplainable ways. Hidden away at a secluded hotel, Ori and his wife Max have survived for years on scavenged scraps and fickle luck. But when Max's shadow disappears, the couple are divided, racing across the urban wasteland, Max chasing her fleeing memories, Ori chasing his fleeing wife. Meanwhile, Olympic hopeful archer Nas, separated by an ocean from her Iranian family, abandons her shelter in Boston to traverse America with only a bow to protect herself and a beloved companion. And beyond them all is patient R.A., an accident victim who suffered total retrograde amnesia even before the forgetting could steal memory from him. After exposure to the first discovered Shadowless, the amnesia gains unique insight into the forgetting and its true nature. But as Nas, Ori, and Max's past spiral towards conflict and upheaval, what role would the amnesiac play as the one who gathers? The Book of M is available now from William Morrow. And Pung, welcome to Fictitious. Thank you so much for having me. So this novel first came out, I think, in like 2018? Yes, correct. It's an interesting time period for us to be discussing and reading and experiencing sort of pandemic, epidemic novels, post-apocalyptic things, considering we live in the age of COVID and lifestyles have changed radically for pretty much everybody around the planet. For you as an author of this kind of work and to have people reading this now, do you feel prescient about certain things? What's that experience like having lived in your own head in this kind of experience for a while? Clearly, we're not post-apocalyptic in what we're in right now, but certainly there are some parallels. Like, how does that feel for you? Yeah, it has been kind of eerie, especially, you know, later in the novel, it, it gets a lot more magical. But in the beginning, a lot of the characters are really concerned with figuring out what's the first thing they should do or how should they prepare or stay safe. And they actually end up making a lot of mistakes uh, because I wanted it to feel realistic. I, I had imagined that if something really devastating or dangerous was happening to our current modern world, I think most of us are not really actually that prepared or knowledgeable about what the best thing to do is, you know, which is how we ended up with like no toilet paper all across right. the United States, <laughs> even though like, you know, toilet paper is not really the first thing you probably need in a really serious crisis, but, but that's what happened. And so, you know, years ago when I was writing, because I was probably writing the book back in, I, I guess like 2016, all of that kind of possibility just seemed, you know, really far away. It was just kind of a fun adventure to imagine the ways in which my mostly urban dwelling, you know, office desk job, having people would attempt to prepare themselves and probably mostly fail or make a lot of mistakes. And then, you know, this happened. And a lot of us were all similarly kind of unprepared and caught unawares. And that has been a really eerie thing to watch. It, I think it's interesting that when this whole thing started up in real life, there was this kind of wave of sales for pandemic books, which was which was fascinating for me because uh, that's not the immediately the place I ran whenever I was looking at subject matter to help me kind of mentally escape from what was going on in everyday life. But when this book was presented to me, and this has been on my list for a really long time, so I was excited to get you on the show. Uh, but what I did find when I started reading it initially was like sort of like waves of anxiety reading this story because I could I could kind of feel a kinship to these characters. Like you said, whether it's we're in an age where a lot of things are weirdly scarce all of a sudden, things that we would have completely taken for granted before. And I think maybe also sort of a, a newfound awareness, of, at least for me, where you'd like to think that when tough times come that you're stoic and you're ready to face anything and you can handle the sacrifices. But knowing how much the extra layer of 
work that you have to do just to keep things disinfected is exhausting and the tediousness of having a lot of the things that you turn to before vanish so your kind of every day feels like the same and how often I have felt myself crack under that kind of pressure. I was reading particularly the stuff with Ori and Max and having that feeling of like, oh, I get this on a level that I don't think I ever would have before. And I understand so well how this pressure would be just beating down on them. But I'm curious for you writing this, like you said, like in 2016, what was the original genesis of this? Because there's echoes of post-apocalyptic, you know, kind of dystopian storytelling that we might find familiar, but they're clearly big, distinct twists that are very, very different. So where did this first come from? Well, I had been trying to write something that had something to do with shadows because I just find them really interesting as a concept. Uh, You know, they're huge symbols in a lot of different works of art, different pieces of literature and in cultures and, you know, folklore and all that. And it was just proving really difficult though. I couldn't find a way into the story and then I couldn't, I just, I wasn't able to make anything work kind of in a, a literary way, which is the way that I was trying to write it at first, like a very realistic kind of literary novel and it wasn't until I realized that the reason it was it was being so difficult is because it wanted to be magical and fantastical. And then, I mean, as soon as I figured that out, the the story came really fast and the world kind of ended itself. Like there was there was no way that the world wasn't going to end in the novel, because if you gave that many people that kind of a strange power, it would just be too destabilizing, you know. It, it wasn't like the world ended and then I thought of the magic. The magic was the thing that just, it just wanted the environment to just be a whole new kind of story where once the slate was wiped clean, I could kind of do anything, you know, and go anywhere with the magic. Yeah, I think it's, as our present moment uh, illustrates, it doesn't take that much deviation from the norm to cause certain things to break down. While we're mostly trying to adapt to a new normal, you know, there are people who are flipping out because they can't get their hair did. March, <laughs> marching on federal buildings with guns and getting away with it somehow. It's a weird moment in time. So in this particular space, there's uh, you know, these people who have lost their shadows and then in turn have lost their memories, but are still existing in the world, but are also changing it uh, in this very inexplicable fashion that presents a, a very different kind of circumstance than we usually see in these kind of dystopian tales. Can you kind of talk about some of that that change in the world? Like what what happens? And in particular, I mean, I think this book is kind of hard to define genre wise, at least for the say the first half of the novel, um, because it you know reads as spec fic, but it slowly rolls out those fantasy elements. So can you kind of just explain that state of the world and how this sort of magic fits into it without getting you know too heavily spoilery? Yeah. So um, I think um, with respect to your point about the genre, I think that the way that the the magic kind of rolls out is it's sort of the way that the characters in the novel discover it themselves, you know, because, you know, if, if something strange in the world happens, sort of like with, with COVID, you sort of first hear about it in bits and pieces from news broadcasts and internet articles, and then you start hearing rumors from friends, then you might see some things out there yourself. And then, you know, finally through your own personal experience, when you are forced to go out into this very changed world for the first time, that's when kind of the new reality really hits you. And I wanted readers to have that same experience discovering the world as the characters have. And so everything starts kind of subtle and it builds from there. But the the way that the magic works, uh, so the magic is based on, not scientifically, but sort of thematically on the way that memory loss or uh, certain diseases like Alzheimer's or dementia work. So for example, I think it's kind of common uh, for people who are suffering from, for example, Alzheimer's, they might forget who the person is in front of them, who's their wife, but they remember that they have a daughter and this person is familiar. And so they think it's their daughter, you know, so your mind kind of tries to fill in like if you've forgotten something, that's that's a very scary and unnatural thing. And I think it would be very natural for your mind to try to fill in that gap with the next most logical thing that you could think of, either scientifically or emotionally. And so that's what the shadowless kind of end up doing. They 
when they forget something, they try to fill it in with their next best guess. But because they have this power, their next best guess ends up actually physically affecting the world and whatever they've thought of ends up manifesting. So in that example, you could possibly change your wife into your daughter through that magic. Very early on in the novel, there's a moment where the Ori character realizes that uh, things have gone askew with his wife's situation because he encounters a, uh, a deer, a buck in the wilderness, and he realizes that instead of antlers, that it has wings on its head. Getting into the novel, that's the first time you encounter one of these results, and it isn't explained to begin with. It definitely leaves a sense of disorientation uh, for the reader, um, and I mean that in a good way, in that sense of like of intrigue, where you're like, wait, what the hell just happened, and what does that mean, and how does he jump to this next conclusion? And uh, and I think that also kind of brings me to kind of how the structure of of the story is put together, because the, when the narrative starts, we begin some years in the future since the collapse of society. And we start off with Ori and with Max and and not too long afterwards, we meet Nas. At the same time as we're seeing their present day plot unfold, we're spending a lot of time in exposition, kind of learning about the past, how we got here, the events that led up to this and uh, and the change in the world. It's pretty exposition heavy while at the same time moving the plot forward in the present day. I think that can be really challenging uh, to pull off that kind of structure to maintain momentum and, and a solid sense of pacing. And you do it very, very well, which is very impressive for a debut novel. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what were you doing to manage that uh, that structure? And was that something that that was coming just naturally as you were drafting? Or is that something that took a lot of work to make function? Uh, well, I mean, all, all writing takes just so much work, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> it's so much work. Um, but it was, it was natural in that I didn't plan anything. Like I, I didn't have a, an outline for like where I was going to drop exposition in and where I was going to move the, the present narrative plot forward. Um, I think it just came out of my personal love for stories like that. Like I would rather rather than getting all the backstory first and then moving into the narrative, I think sometimes it means more when you're in the narrative and then you're able to flash back to moments from before or, you know, moments where something was different because seeing the contrasting situations closer together like that, it makes it mean more than if you just got a big dump of history first and then you launch straight into the story. Uh, and especially when it's a story about, you know, memory and love and, and loss the way that the book of M is putting the before and the after next to each other just kind of highlights the memory of whatever that thing is even more. Yeah. I think sometimes it can be, especially if you have a longer novel, it can be difficult to start off with a lot of backstory and then have the, uh, the reader connect the dots of, you know, that connective tissue. If you haven't placed them next to each other, you have kind of what I think of as, uh, as the lost structure, thinking about Lost, the TV show, where they did a lot of that, where you would have sort of a setup, they would have a flashback, and then you would come back. And those those things would overlay in a way that created more meaning and more understanding for the audience. And that's kind of what I see here, where we, we get that parallel of here's the stuff that happened in the past, and here's what that means for now. I think that with the Ori, um, and his name is Orlando, but um, but his wife calls him Ori, we see him as a character early on, where in a lot of ways, I feel like he's kind of a cipher for the audience in the sense that, I don't know, like that initially that we we know a lot about Ori, we know about what he cares about. So we know he cares about Max, we know he cares about safety and shelter and surviving, and he cares about rules that are that he uses to keep them safe, especially considering her circumstance and having just lost her shadow. But Ori himself, it doesn't seem like a person who dwells a lot on himself, which I think is weird because I think a lot of us spend a lot of time thinking about ourselves. <laughs> and uh, and as the the story goes on and that that information develops out in the backstory, I think that we see a lot about who Ori is and why what his motivations are and and why he operates in a very reactionary kind of way um, through a lot of the things in the story. And I think that is developed out really well with the structure that you have there. And I will circle circle back around to him in a bit because I do want to dive 
into to all the individual characters. But there is something about the structure of this that I want to talk about too, which is something that always interests me. And anybody who listens to the show on a regular basis knows that I'm I get really obsessed with POVs, um, and in particular with stories that play with POV. You have three characters that are third person, limited to slightly omniscient, I guess. I'm not sure exactly how you would categorize it. And then you have Max, whose story is told directly through her own words, through audio recordings. So you get a little bit of narration element with her, but then the rest of the time she's talking into a voice recorder. And so you get like a first person narrative in there. So that's they're kind of at odds a little bit with each other in that structure uh, and it totally works. But I was curious as to why you chose to go with that approach, why her particular narrative stands separate from the other ones. Uh, It was actually one of the things I was the most nervous about because to me it seemed kind of experimental to have these other perspectives in third and then she's the only one that's speaking directly to the re I mean she's speaking directly to Ori because she's narrating her tape recorder entries as if she's speaking to him because she misses him so much but it it feels like in effect she's speaking directly to the reader but I'm really glad I ended up leaving it the way it is because uh, she's the only viewpoint character in the novel who loses her shadow and so she ends up being uh, the reader's only window into what it's like from her side, the shadowless side, because all of the other characters are, they, they see the magic and they witness it, but they're seeing it from the outside and they don't understand it. And it can be very scary to them or very dangerous. But with Max's entries, you get to read about what the magic feels like from the inside. It, it just allowed me to, because the novel is fairly bleak at many points because every you know everyone's just trying to survive and they may or may not be losing or finding people that they love again um and so uh i just thought it would be really important to let you see things from max's side because everyone else their chapters are kind of like fear and survival heavy at least in the beginning and her chapters end up because you can you can see the magic from her perspective they have kind of a more of a sense of wonder and possibility and beauty to them, even though she is also, you know, in a dangerous circumstance. There were moments in there where I've seen people mention that, you know, that the story resonates with them the way like, um, was it, is it station 11 um, or the stand, oh, okay. um, you know, things along those lines that have that sort of travelogue in, in a, post-apocalyptic world. I said, I don't know anything about Station Eleven. I just see that reference made a lot. <laughs> I haven't read that novel. <laughs> but for me, there were there were moments where I thought of the recorded elements made me think kind of like um, there's a video game called The Last of Us and it's a post-apocalyptic uh, yeah. world and it's very bleak. And there are moments in it where there's a lot of things where you're learning about the world through these sort of recorded found footage elements where you're, or, you know, things that are written from people that they're kind of picking up on sort of like a, a modern archaeology, exploring their near past and figuring out how all this affected people. And I had moments of that too. But like you said, Max's section of the story is the one place where things feel lighter and less bleak uh, than other ones because she is experiencing it from this completely different direction. In turn, I think the stuff that that Ori and Nas are experiencing vary from from horror to the absurd because of the way that the reality is warping. And I want to be careful here because I don't want to spoil things that happen later in the book, particularly ones that I think have kind of big impact moments. But like there's a moment where Ori is like hiding under a highway overpass in the night and he hears something cross over it that's heavy and lumbering and far too large. And when that scene happened, I had this moment of being like, wait, that feels very horror ish. And I almost like I'd almost kind of forgotten I was in a fantasy for a little bit because the because the nature of the story was so ground level for these characters for a long stretch in there. And early on, those elements kind of appear sort of sporadically where things really get weird. And there was that moment of being like, oh, this is where the world feels off kilter, where things feel askew. And then sometime later, there's a scene where Nas and a couple of her companions are standing outside of essentially outside of Manhattan and watching something super duper crazy happening um, <laughs> that is both horrific and kind of beautiful. After I after I read that scene, I told my wife about it and and I'm being cryptic here, you know, as far as not saying what that scene's about. But I told my wife about it, who I was sort of kind of half narrating the story to because this is how I, she has to put up with me sort of reciting my ideas but every book I'm reading at any given time she's very patient like that <laughs> but I explained that scene and and she she stopped and she's like 
I don't know, that sounds really kind of cool and beautiful. And I was like, yes, that's it exactly. It was kind of cool and beautiful in a destructive, crazy, absolutely absurdist way. And I like that when you're examining a world that's gone this far off the deep end, that you can you can see all those different aspects of it. Uh, it was also super fun to write those kinds of things. Yeah, I can imagine there are a few of those where I, I definitely got that sense of like, oh, this is you having a good time. You were definitely experiencing this one in a way that was probably a little more pleasurable than writing some of the darker portions of the story. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Um, and I think that was why that was one of the other really, I don't want to say fun things about ending the world in the book, but there was something special about getting to change recognizable things from our real reality. Uh, as opposed to if I had invented a whole new planet or continent or something and I was setting the magic there because if I destroyed or created something in that new place, uh, readers don't, you don't necessarily have context for what it was before. But if I destroy or change something that's very recognizable from our current world, everybody knows what it was like before. And that, that juxtaposition between what it, what it was and what I've made it into, I think there's something kind of there's a shared thing that that all we can all have about that, me and the readers. We all understand that thing. There's also something I want to talk about with your particular voice in writing this, and that is that despite there being a number of you know scenes of violence and uh, definitely some very scary imagery, you tend to kind of veer away from sort of describing those sequences explicitly. Uh, There are moments where, say, like Nas has to kill somebody with her bow and arrow or even just an arrow in hand in the midst of hand to hand combat. You know, and some of these kind of dystopian books, you would get very viscerally into what happened there. But that's not how this story kind of comes together. And I'm curious if that's an aspect of your own voice coming out in the story or if it was a specific choice you were making as you were constructing it because you wanted to leave things up for the audience to kind of feel like what, what was your thinking on that? Yeah, I think it might just be my personal taste as uh, like as a reader or consumer of stories, because when I think about like when I'm watching a movie, some gore is, you know, okay or good, but if there's too much of it and that's really the focus of the scene, it almost starts to get kind of boring after a while, like despite its shock value. And when I think about scenes or moments from movies that involve violence that are often the most powerful, it's usually the ones where the violence is happening and the camera isn't on the victim, but the camera at the moment that the victim dies or is injured cuts to the face of the person that loves the victim. And you see the expression of like shock or disbelief or, you know, like it's like a memory reel of their entire marriage or their life running through the victim's face. As you know, that the, the victim is, dying off screen. I think with the book of M, I was trying to do that kind of in text form where I wanted to focus more on like the, the emotional loss from these acts of violence than the physical loss. So instead of writing about, you know, the guts spilling out of somebody as they're getting stabbed, I wanted to focus on like what that dying character meant to all of the other characters in the scene. Like, are they losing their friend or their father or their husband that seemed like it might affect readers more intensely than just simply describing physical gore. Yeah, I think of it as sort of um, in the old film Fight Club, there's the angel face sequence. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but there's a, a scene that was designed originally to be very visceral and violent and then was eventually recut um, so that it focused almost entirely on the reactions of the crowd around the fight happening. And it ended up being far more impactful in that way than they originally expected it to be. Yeah, I think that kind of lesson of pulling away from that action and seeing the emotional reaction from other people has uh, an enormous impact versus say like something like, uh, and I I keep going back to sort of like TV movie references here because they've got a very visual sort of reference, but a, a show like Westworld where it's chock full of graphic violence and nudity. And I think the end result, and I think the intended result of that is that after a few episodes of it, you become desensitized to it and that it becomes part of the, oh, this is just that world and you're used to seeing that stuff where you're in this world. Um, so I think it can be a very conscious choice to approach it that way. But that spot in the middle, like you said, where it's just gore for gore's sake, eventually kind of just loses its impact entirely. Yeah, yeah, I agree. There's a, a character that I mentioned at the top in here. Uh, he's referred by a number of different names. Sometimes he's patient RA. Um, sometimes he's the amnesiac or the visitor. 
and uh, and there's some other more uh, mythological type of names that get assigned to him as well. Um, he has no specific name for a reason um, because he chooses to basically shed the name he can't remember any association to. But this is a guy who has gone through a very bad car accident, come out the other side with full retrograde amnesia. He has no memory of his previous life at all. And this happens just ahead of the forgetting even ha happening all over the world. And so he's in this very unique perspective uh, and situation as somebody who has already lost all of his memory and has nothing to lose to this, uh, this situation and a completely new kind of way of looking at it. While he's mentioned early on in the story, he doesn't really make his full appearance until I think like 100 or 105 pages or so into the novel. So he's kind of a late arrival into it. And, it, and it, to me, he signals kind of a, a shift in the momentum of the story. For me, it's actually the point where the anxiousness that I was feeling going through the story, which is very much my own reaction from the present life, you know, and then reading this uh, on the page. Um, my, my anxiousness sort of disappeared with him coming in and was replaced with intense curiosity because that's I, this is where I wanted to see how this world was evolving. Why did you wait that long to introduce this character? And then kind of what sort of role does he play in this narrative? So he is very, he's a very important character. And um, the way that you, uh, so you're right, you actually do end up hearing about him much earlier than you do that when you finally meet him. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's something like for the first 100 pages, uh, which mostly take place, minus the flashbacks, they mostly take place about two years after this shadowless phenomenon has spread across across the globe uh, and kind of collapsed civilization. And you know, in the pockets where there are still survivors, you start to get these rumors of some kind of a person or a creature or a thing who might have these fantastical powers and they might be good or bad. They might be a savior or something very dangerous. And then it ends up turning out that those rumors are all about this guy, the amnesiac. And I thought, because, because he's such an important character, I felt that to introduce him properly and to make him feel to readers the way that he feels to the characters when they finally get to meet him, I needed that amount of space to build up those rumors and give them time to spread throughout the world so that the characters and the readers could kind of encounter them and slowly start putting clues together the way that you do with rumors kind of in real life. So by the time you actually get to him, you've gotten all these kind of myths and legends about this, this mysterious character. One of my favorite things in the novel is finding out how the amnesiac was introduced to, I hope I say his name right, Hemu? Hemu? Yeah, Hemu Joshi, yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is the guy who uh, who's the first person to lose his shadow. And he's initially sort of a, an instant media darling because everybody wants to see this happy guy who's out here dancing around without a shadow. And that's so neat and so unique and nobody can figure out what's going on um, well before they understand that this is very tragic for this guy. And in trying to figure out what's happening to him as his memory starts to fail and disappear, they bring over the amnesiac from America in order to sit down with this guy and, and converse and see if somebody with a similar perspective can understand what's going on. The scenes between those two are super impactful. They develop out a lot of the mythology and set up a lot of the things to come uh, with the story. And, and I gotta say, in general, I'm, I tend to like to, to be a little disparaging of, of readers that like really stray towards one or two tropes that they're like super into because I like to read a lot of variety. But I will say, <laughs> I am a total sucker for the amnesia story trope. You know, you take me into a born identity or something like that, or any kind of story that's about a person trying to explore a world where they don't remember anything. And I'm here for it. Um, I have no control. I have, I am a sucker. I must stand, you know, it's all there. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm, you know, I'm completely here for that. But in the, in those scenes exploring that, you have this, this very kind of tender, but brief relationship between these two people figuring out that they're the only ones like themselves in the world. How do you balance out that versus what's to come? Does that make sense? That sounds very like that's, that's a hell of a non question, but hopefully you can pick up something <laughs> from it. Um, well, the, what the first thing that came to mind was just, it is but a lot of those scenes between him and the amnesiac are really kind of tender and intimate and, and quiet compared to a lot of the other stuff that happens in the book. But sometimes the littlest moments in your life end up being the most important. And I think in the amnesiac's case, his meetings with Hemu and 
you know, the time he gets to spend with this person, the first person to ever lose their shadow, just trying to understand where he's coming from and sharing a lot of the same, you know, confusion and fear and a little bit of a sense of wonder at, you know, this condition that they both have. I think it really significantly influences the amnesiac as he moves, you know, further into the story. And it really, I don't want to, I can't, uh, I'm trying not to be spoilery, um, <laughs> but the, the so much of what he learned from Hemu in those conversations becomes really, really significant near the end of the novel. You know, so even though those those moments and that time he got to spend with him, kind of interviewing him and talking with him in the hospital, it ends up being some of the most important stuff that happens. I will say that the uh, the way that particular section of the narrative wraps up wrecked me, just absolutely wrecked me. <laughs> So good job. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, in a good way. You know, I mean, yeah, yeah I was, I was, yeah. I was briefly ruined as a human being, but in the way that you get that, at least that knowledge of like well executed craft, where I was like, oh, well done. I didn't see this coming at all, and it hurt me a lot, and that was the intended result. So yeah, yeah, good job. <laughs> <laughs> it's the weirdest thing to, to like for writers to like part of your job is to emotionally manipulate the audience and to make them suffer and to have them thank you for it afterwards. Cause it's, that seems like that's gotta be a really <laughs> weird thing. Oh, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes someone will tweet something at me about, about that or about the end of the book, which is sort of bittersweet. And I'm like, should I, do I say, sorry, do I say, thank you? Should I tell them I'm dancing around with joy that they're sad? Cause that seems weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I feel like every writer's therapist is really got the work cut out for them. <laughs> But, you know, as the readers, we seem to keep asking for it. So I guess it's a pretty two way street. We have talked a lot about all these characters except for uh, Nas and like and and I mean, and that's kind of her abbreviated name. I feel like I will completely butcher her full name. But you can you kind of tell us a little bit more about our Archer character in this? Yeah. So she uh, Nas turned out to be, I think, one of the hardest ones to write because in her life, she's the person who everyone depends on and she doesn't depend on anyone. You know, she's made this habit of not needing anyone for anything else. She can do everything herself, that, that kind of a person. And of course, one of the central themes of the book kind of ends up being that everybody does need someone else and it makes you stronger to be with other people, not weaker. Um, but since she's such an independent character, kind of a go at your own way and, and do everything all by yourself, she ended up, resisted learning that truth like in every draft <laughs> that I wrote and it um yeah and it and I I had kind of boxed myself into a corner with her because since she was so independent she was like the only character in all of her talking with no one and she was just this really stoic solitary thing and what ended up uh kind of cracking her for me and, and turning her into a real person was in a revision I ended up adding uh, she always had a mother, but she's uh, kind of estranged from her mother. But I ended up adding a sister who's a bridge between the sister, the younger sister. And she's very important to Nas and is also still in contact with their mother. And so the sister kind of becomes a bridge back to the rest of uh, Nas's family and is the thing that kind of allows her to open back up and be a human again, I guess. Well, she definitely gives us uh, the one character has uh, a little bit of martial ability, you know, so Ori is running around often getting the hell beat out of him and <laughs> and keeps keeps going. And, so, and I think he's an interesting character because he is more reactive. He seems like a guy who I wouldn't say he's a passive guy. Um, he certainly does what he needs to do, but he's certainly a fearful person. Uh, Nas is somebody who, I mean, also it, they're all living in some level of fear, um, because you know, the world's crazy and everything wants to kill them, but Nas is out there you know, having a much more proactive stance, having, uh, the ability to defend herself more directly. Um, she starts racking up a bit of a body count as things go, goes along and falls in with this sort of militia group. And, uh, yeah, so I think there's, there's a very you know, interesting counterpoint between that. Um, and I think you've, you've illustrated a lot of that between like Ori and Max and, and Nas in there, but I liked that each one of these characters and their separate journeys very much have a different thematic element that they seem to be exploring. Yeah, um, they. I don't. I don't know if that was a super conscious choice, but definitely upon revision, I, I realized that Nas is definitely the most capable of surviving this kind of a world, probably. Uh, and Ori is perhaps the more 
realistic one, which I, you know, he, he, <laughs> you know, I mean, I think, per, I think I would be totally, you know, unprepared and, and terrified to do any of the things he did. And, you know, because in, in a situation like that, it would be so much smarter to just stay put in a safe hideout unless there was a really compelling reason to, to leave it. Yeah. Um, but I mean, that's what ends up happening to Ori. He, his really compelling reason is, and it's probably one of the only reasons that most of us would make the choice that he does. And it's that the person that he loves goes missing and he's pretty much the only one that can find her. So yeah, I just wanted him to feel as kind of realistic and sympathetic. We, you know, we have, there are plenty of gung-ho heroes in such apocalyptic fiction and I just wanted him to be just a, a really believable guy. <laughs> Yeah, I know I like that because yeah, we we get a lot of like the the stoic, grumbly hero, and this is a person who is, I think, very much the opposite of stoic. He is operating at a level of desperation all the time um, because it's it's it is a desperate situation. Mm -hmm. And again, I feel like I've harped it on a lot in here, but like just given you know it, our our present moment with the COVID thing, for me, it becomes incredibly stressful just having to wipe down the groceries and the deliveries every day and let them sit outside in the garage for four days before I can allow something to the house and just how tiresome that becomes. Yeah, Going out to get my mail and worried that the person walking their dog is you know within six feet of me, that kinds of things is just stressful enough to cause me to spiral out once in a while to think about living in a world where like they're splitting a, a small bag of potato chips as their one meal in a day. And it's the last thing they have left, you know, that you're going to have a very different kind of perspective and that your average person who wasn't, I don't know, a prepper isn't walking around with, with a Swiss army knife of, of abilities ready to take on this new world. Um, so yeah, I thought that was a refreshing change as far as a character. Uh, you you mentioned a little bit earlier a bit of your writing process stuff, but I want to know: are you are you an outliner? Are you a discovery writer or a pantser? However you want to re refer to it, somewhere in the middle. What's that look like for you? Yeah, I am a total pantser or discovery writer. <laughs> what do you want to call? <laughs> I I am totally incapable of outlining. I can't plot ahead of wherever I am in the current moment. I, I just have absolutely no plan. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any type of like plotting system that you're paying attention to or thinking, or is it, is that something that still feels too much a structure for you to adapt to? I mean, I would love some structure. It seems like a really nice, <laughs> Uh, strategic, probably much more efficient way than I do it. So I would love it. It's just, I'm like, I'm not able. Usually the, the most I, I, I come up with a cool premise like, oh, people's shadows are disappearing all over the world. And then uh, there's magic. And then I had a clear feeling for the end, which I can't say without spoiling it. But I had, I knew that was how it was going to end because I knew the characters, but I had nothing else, like absolutely nothing else in the middle. I didn't have, I only had Ori and Max. I didn't have any of the other characters. And actually, because I'm, I'm not a plotter, I thought that this story was going to be a really short, really tightly set Thing between these two people it was going to be sort of like a domestic drama except in the apocalypse and then it ended up being global and there are like four perspectives and it jumps back and forth across two years of time and different continents <laughs> and um it just really took on a life of its own but i think it, it wouldn't have done that if i had planned it in a more organized way because i would have you know all of it would have seemed too kind of outlandish at the time for me to think I could have done it. But when I was discovering it myself as I was writing, I just had more faith in it, I think. So did that kind of balance out the feeling of, oh my gosh, I'm going to be writing 500 pages of this bleak and terrifying world? Well, I think the magic got me through the bleakness part because it was so, uh, I mean, I had to write some of the bleakness because I wanted it to still feel kind of emotionally true you know because if you're in a dangerous situation and your loved ones are in danger it's it's not super happy it's just really scary um but i got to write so much of the magic and the, the like just the weird things that it it did it, that just kept it really uh just really interesting and uh compelling for me this was your debut novel it's been out for a little bit um uh, the book of m is available now uh what are you working on these days what's coming up next for you so I have just finished the first draft of my second novel, but because I am a panther, it's incredibly messy. Uh, <laughs> and there's, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And I'm not even totally sure what it's about. Um, no, it's, that's not true. I'm, I know that it is about a map that has a secret on it and about places that may or may not exist on these maps or in the real world. But um, 
yeah, it still, it still needs a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's 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 what first drafts are for, right? Just to, to sort things yeah. out, and then yeah. from there, you have a foundation to build on. Uh, right. Where should people be following you and your work so they can find out about that new stuff when it's coming out? Uh, I'm probably most uh, well. I have a website, punkshepherd.com, and then I'm I'm most often on Twitter, and my handle is just at punkshepherd. Awesome. Well, like I said, uh, the book of M is available from William Morrow. It's available from all of the book retailers uh, online and physically wherever you can, you know, actually go and maybe get some contactless pickup, things like that. Support your local bookstores. This is a unique and challenging and really beautifully constructed novel. Uh, I was so impressed with the craft, with the the nature of the characters in the world and how many times it surprised me. And uh, like I said, it made me anxious, but it also gave me moments of beauty and uh and things that fascinated me and and piqued my curiosity so um i was really struck with this novel so i'm hoping that that people even if they are like me and are kind of shying away from the sort of pandemically inclined post-apocalyptic things right now that this would be a one they'd give uh, a chance to because i think it's a fascinating read that can take them someplace new and pang thank you so much for joining me on fictitious oh thank you so much for having me had a great time This has been Season 5, Episode 9 of Fictitious. Listen and subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or search for the show using your favorite podcasting app. Every episode of Fictitious is now available on YouTube, too, if that's more your speed. And you can also listen to and download every episode at fictitiouspodcast.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please tell all your book-loving writer friends, share it on social media, or write a review. All of that supports the authors who appear on the program and helps me to grow the podcast. My next interview features Richard Kadri, author of Ballistic Kiss, the latest book in the long-running Sandman Slim series. Subscribe now so you don't miss it. I'm Adrian Buskey. Thanks for listening to Fictitious. Fictitious. <laughs>